thank you very much for the invitation to talk today about my work looking at how semen um, is immunomodulatory in the recipient genital tract with a special attention to how this changes the dynamics of sexually transmitted viral infections. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I'll start with some goals for today's talk. And um, my main goal is just to get everyone to think broadly about how semen impacts immunity um, and viral transmission in the recipient genital tract. Um, because this has important implications for a number of different uh, biological systems. So this has imp implications for the design of therapeutics ag against sexually transmitted infections like HIV, um, where it's really important to consider the role of semen. So in sexually transmitted infections, semen is almost always present during uh, transmission of the pathogen, and it's a very immunoactive um, biofluid. So we need to consider what it might be doing when we're thinking about how to protect against STIs. It has important implications for the detection of infectious pathogens in biological fluids. So, for example, if you can pick up something by, say, an RNA assay in semen, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be infectious. And that's partly because semen has a really strong effect on the um, infectious potential of viruses. And this has important implications for fertility and pregnancy complications, including things like unexplained infertility, recurrent miscarriages, uh, preeclampsia, and preterm birth. So um, in general, what I'm going to go over today is the components in semen and sort of think about what the job of semen really is. Um, most of my work focuses on the extracellular vesicle fraction of semen, so I'm going to introduce what those are and why I'm particularly interested in studying them when I'm thinking about immunoregulatory factors in semen. Um, I'm going to present some data showing that semen extracellular vesicles, which I call SEV, impair memory immune responses um, by affecting antigen-presenting cell function. I'm going to go over a little bit of the RNA cargo carried by our semen extracellular vesicles. And I'm going to show some data um, about the direct effects of SCV on sexually transmitted viruses, including HIV and Zika virus. So it's been recognized for quite a long time that semen impacts immunity. And this makes a lot of sense in light of an evolutionary pressure to support um, conception and to decrease any potential immune responses against semen or fetal antigens. Um, and it's true that semen is overall tolerizing against co-delivered antigens like paternal antigens um, and any um, conceptions that result from uh, that specific um, partner. So the Robertson group in Australia has done a lot of elegant mouse studies showing that exposure to semen induces a small pool of antigen-specific Tregs in the periphery in mice, and this is without the need for conception. And it's thought that this small pool of antigen-specific Tregs is then poised to expand upon successful conception and really helps support the development of um, pregnancies. And there's a lot of um, epidemiological evidence in humans that exposure to semen is important uh, in reproductive health. Um, so there's a condition called preeclampsia uh, that can arise during pregnancy, and it's thought to arise primarily um, due to an aberrant immune response to fetal cells um, during placentation. And a number of studies have demonstrated that motor exposure to a specific partner semen, so longer term exposure during unprotected sex to a specific partner semen is very protective against developing preeclampsia. This is all suggesting that the um, immunotolerizing effects of semen are very important for fertility and conception. Now, semen is a complex fluid. It contains a cellular fraction, and we're all familiar with sperm cells in semen. Um, there are also germ cells and leukocytes, and the concentration of leukocytes in semen can vary a lot according, um, or according to men and their, and their health status. Um, there is a soluble protein fraction in semen, and this contains things like cytokines, chemokines, other bioactive proteins. There are bioactive lipids like prostaglandins that are present at very high concentration in semen. There are RNA protein complexes, and there is an extremely high concentration of extracellular vesicles, which themselves contain all of these different types of cargo as well. Um, these effects of each of these different fractions are very multifaceted. They probably target different cell types in the recipient mucosa, and they do a lot of different things. Um, they may impact on multiple different outcomes in the recipient mucosa. 
So we believe that it's important to study these fractions sort of separately to understand mechanistically what they're doing, and then we can put together a whole um, holistic picture of what semen does in the recipient mucosa. So despite the fact that semen is immunosuppressive and tolerizing, um, studies on how this impacts immunity and immune responses in the recipient mucosa are um, few and far between. A few studies have looked at unfractionated seminal plasma and isolated extracellular vesicles, which are sometimes called prostosomes in the literature, and shown that they have some sort of general immunosuppressive properties like inhibiting NK cell function or phagocytosis or um, inhibiting neutrophil um, degranulation. But in general, these studies are older, few and far between, and mechanisms aren't well studied. So this immunosuppressive property of semen might also be really important in infectious disease. Um, for example, um, in couples with ap active human papillomavirus infections, if you can get them um, to start using condoms, thereby reducing exposure to semen, you can get uh, regression of infection and even regression of early um, cervical lesions in the female partner, implying that the immune response to HPV is functions better in the absence of um, exposure to semen. This also might help to explain why we have HIV vaccine candidates that seem to elicit strong HIV-specific T cell responses when we measure them in the blood, but have yet these vaccines have failed to protect against sexually transmitted HIV. So as I mentioned, my work is primarily on the extracellular vesicle fraction in semen, so I'd like to give a quick overview of what this is. So extracellular vesicles is a broad term that encompasses both exosomes and microvesicles. Um, exosomes and microvesicles in general are lipid-bound um, little like subcellular particles that are around on the order of 40 to 200 nanometers typically. Um, the difference between exosomes and microvesicles is their uh, origin in the cell. So exosomes are thought to arise from an endosomal pathway. So you get formation of endosomes by budding of the plasma membrane, and then inward budding of this endosomal um, membrane forms an exosome. At this point, the exosomes can be loaded with contents from the cell cytoplasm or transmembrane proteins from the endosomal membrane. Um, you get formation of these multivesicular endosomes. Some of these go on to fuse with lysosomes, and this is just degraded contents that the cell can recycle. But many of these multivesicular endosomes can go on to fuse with the plasma membrane and release a burst of exosomes into the extracellular space. Microvesicles, on the other hand, are thought to be a little bit larger and thought to arise primarily from outward budding of the um, plasma membrane. Now, as I mentioned, these vesicles, both types, uh, exosomes and microvesicles, contain cargo that's loaded in their cell of origin. So they can have transmembrane proteins. They have an interesting lipid makeup that's different from the plasma membrane of the cell. For example, they have exposed phosphatidylserine. Um, they can carry mRNAs, including long non-coding mRNAs and mRNAs that, um, long non-coding RNAs and mRNAs that are competent for translation. Um, in cells that uh, take up these exosomes. And they contain, um, they're highly enriched for microRNAs and they're enriched for specific types of microRNAs. So if you survey the microRNA content of a cell versus a vesicle, you'll typically find differences implying that the loading of these microRNAs into vesicles is a very controlled process. So why are we studying the EV component of semen? Um, and the original reason came many years ago from uh, my mentor, Florian Hladek, who was studying HIV transmission and doing a lot of transmission electron microscopy studies. And he observed often that HIV virions, so here with the capsid, dark capsid you can see, were very often found bound to, surrounded by, or surrounding these vesicles in his TEM pictures. So that made him start to think about are there EVs in semen when HIV is sexually transmitted and what might they be doing? So um, we started this project by just sort of looking at what is the EV content in semen. Um, out of 23 different samples, we've found that there are on the order of 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 14th um, extracellular vesicles per mil. Um, and EVs are made by every cell type and you can find them in all body fluids. So they're in tears, urine, saliva, blood plasma, cerebrospinal fluid, 
um, all sorts of different body fluids, but the concentration of EVs is about the highest of any body fluid ever tested. It's Plasma is pretty close to this concentration, but it seems that semen has the highest concentration of vesicles in any biofluid. And this is really interesting because when we think about viral transmission, we can detect viruses in semen at RNA copies. And if we assume that an RNA copy of a virus corresponds to a virion, in samples of semen with low um, viral loads, it's on the order of hundreds of copies of RNA. And for HIV and Zika, with semen samples that have the highest detected viral loads, it's usually on the order of 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th um, variants per mil. And that means that in all semen samples, these extracellular vesicles are outnumbering variants on the order of 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 8th. So there are a lot of them in there, and they're really outnumbering viruses. Um, so we thought what they might be doing is really important. Um, and vesicles in general, or extracellular vesicles in general, are probably most well studied in the um, in the cancer field. And this is because uh, extracellular vesicles are very important to cancer. Uh, tumor and cancer cells make a lot more vesicles than regular cells, and they're very important for remodeling the tumor microenvironment. This figure comes from a review of extracellular vesicles um, in the tumor microenvironment. And I just put it up here to point out that there is a lot of precedent for EVs being important and being immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory uh, messengers. So it's already been demonstrated that they, that they can induce dendritic cells to become tolerogenic DCs and induce antigen-specific T cell tolerance. They can affect dendritic cell cross-presentation and thereby activation of memory T cells. Um, They've been shown to induce um, CD4 T cells to turn into uh, FOXP3 positive T regs. They can decrease proliferation of T cells and inhibit cytotoxic uh, functions of CD8 positive T cells and NK cells. So I came into the project with the hypothesis that EVs and semen impact immunoregulation in the recipient genital tract. And we were particularly interested in understanding this in context of what are they doing to memory immune responses that we might be able to induce with um, anti-HIV vaccines? So I asked the question, how do SCV alter the function of leukocytes? The main leukocytes I'm interested in are the antigen-presenting cells, so dendritic cells of the genital mucosa. Um, dendritic cells in the skin are called Langerhans cells, and they, uh, they reside in the epithelial layer. And then there are T cells in the tissue that typically reside a bit more deeply and might be not be directly accessed by exosomes from semen. So we are interested in um, looking at whether SCV impede memory T cell immune responses, because as I mentioned, we are interested in this in the context of vaccines against HIV. Uh, but people who have had HIV vaccines are very few and far between, so we use model antigens in the study, um, C CMV or EMV EBV peptides or proteins. So these are viruses that most people, a majority of people have been exposed to and will have memory T cell immune responses. So we can just take typical blood donors, add in these antigens, and then look for a memory T cell immune response by production of cytokines by a T cell. So we just asked the question, what happens when we throw SEV into this mix? And what we saw was that SEV significantly decreased cytokine production by both CD4 and CD8 memory T cells. Um, so here we're plotting on the y-axis, this is percent of cells responding to the antigen, either CMV or EBV antigen, uh, and uh, no an uh, cultured alone with antigen here and with SEV. Um, and we saw in every case that the presence of SCV inhibits um, the production of cytokines. Okay, um, so it seems that SCV do impair memory um, T cell immune responses, but that was a readout of T cell function, but we had a lot of reason to suspect that it wasn't actually T cell function that was being affected directly by um, SCV. Um, and that was partially from some studies we did where we were trying to look at what sorts of cell types were binding to or taking up our, our SCV. So for these experiments, we have dendritic cells labeled with a DC marker that are derived from blood, um, or we have uh, ex vivo vaginal tissues that we chopped up, and then we isolated the cells that migrate out of those tissues, which are primarily the Langerhans cells, the specialized dendritic cells of the skin. And they've migrated out of tissue in conjunction with the T cell in this, in this case. So you can see the LC body is labeled with our fluorescent marker here. And we see the nucleus of the T cell, but not the cell body. 
So these cells were exposed to SCV that were labeled with a fluorescent dye called DII. And what we see is that the DCs and the LCs readily took up um, the EVs and turned red, but we never saw any evidence that a T cell was taking up an EV. So we can also see this by flow cytometry, where we do the same sorts of experiments, putting these fluorescently labeled uh, EVs into PBMC cultures. And what we saw is that antigen-presenting cells, monocytes, and DCs rapidly and readily take up uh, exosomes, whereas the T cells and the B cells never did. Um, so that suggests that the SCV are affecting primarily antigen-presenting cells. Um, and to test this directly, I did this experiment where I isolated antigen-presenting cells and loaded them with antigen and SCV, and then washed so that the only SCV in the system are those that were already taken up by the antigen-presenting cell. And then I added responder T cells, some of which had also been pre-exposed to SCV and then washed. Um, and then again, looked for the production of cytokines as a readout of um, memory T cell immune response. And these are the results from these experiments. Um, and for oh, here, down here, I'm plotting which fraction of cells was exposed to SCV. So either T cells alone, dendritic cells alone, or both fractions together. And for CD8 positive T cells, we saw what we expected was that it, um, adding uh, SEV to DCs alone impaired responses just as much as it did in uh, mixed PBMC cultures, so about 30% impairment in production of cytokines um, when we exposed DCs alone. And adding SEV to T cells alone or to DCs and T cells didn't really change this impairment. Interestingly, we did not see this for CD4 T cells. Um, Although in the mixed PBMC cultures, we saw about the same level of impairment, about 34% less cells making cytokines in response to antigens in the presence of SE. We never recapitulated this when we add the SEV to different fractions, implying that they have to be present during the interaction of APCs and T cells in order to inhibit CD4 T cell responses. So cytokine production isn't the only important function of a memory T cell. Um, it's also import, very important that memory T cells are able to kill virally infected cells. So we measured that in a few ways. We did measure direct killing of CD8 T cells, but those experiments are really complicated, and I'm not going to go over them today in the interest of time. Um, but CD107A is a marker of degranulation um, of cytotoxic T cells, and expression on the surface of the cells means that the cell uh, has a cytotoxic response. Um, so for these experiments, the cells were stimulated with SEB, a superantigen that causes between about 5 and 20% of cells to, um, to respond with cytokines or degranulation. Um, and adding SEV here, again, we're plotting the percent reduction from SEB alone in uh, SEV-exposed cells. And again, we see a strong impairment in cytokine production in SEB-stimulated cells. And we see a strong impairment in the expression of CD107A. And again, for CD8 positive T cells, we could recapitulate this response when DCs alone were exposed to SCV. So it seems clear that SCV are affecting antigen-presenting cell function, but what exactly are they doing to these DCs? So the first thing I looked for was expression of classical co-stimulatory markers, which are important to um, uh, activating a memory T cell. Um, for th these experiments, we have DCs that were cultured either alone in the dark gray or in the presence of SEV, or were given a maturation cocktail called MCM, either alone in the light gray or with SEV in the gray lines. What we saw is with the MCM cocktail, as expected, these markers are upregulated, uh, but the presence of SEV didn't seem to change expression in either case. So next I looked um, uh, for um, a key immunoregulatory enzyme expressed by tolerogenic DCs called IDO. Um, IDO is a molecule that um, basically is a great marker for tolerance in dendritic cells. It um, catabolizes tryptophan, so uh, in the presence of high expression of IDO, tryptophan is depleted, T cells are uh, pushed towards a regulatory phenotype. Um, and what we've seen is that exposure to SCV does cause market upregulation of IDO and DCs. So here at the RNA level, we looked at six hours of culture with SCV or 20 hours, and we saw 10 to over 100-fold upregulation of um, IDO at the RNA level. 
And we've also seen this at the level of protein expression. So this is looking for IDO expression by intracellular um, staining in DCs, either mock or exposed to SEV, and we see high expression of IDO in SEV exposed DCs. So another um, pathway of tolerance that we're looking at in SEV exposed DCs is metabolism. Um, so one key difference between tolerogenic and immunostimulatory DCs is their metabolic phenotype. Um, in dendritic cells, activation or maturation shifts metabolism to glycolysis, whereas in contrast, tolerogenic DCs don't shift to glycolysis and to shift to glycolysis, and they preferentially utilize oxidative phosphorylation or fatty acid oxidation for energy production. So to look at if exposure to SEV is shifting metabolism in our DCs, we used a seahorse XF analyzer um, that measures the ECAR extracellular acidification rate that's plotted on the y-axis here. Um, it's a proxy for glycolysis. So we have our DCs alone here, and our DCs treated with a maturation stimulus. In this case, we used poly-IC, a TLR ligand that will activate DCs. And as expected, we see this upregulation in glycolysis. Um, but in the DCs that were treated with SEV before adding poly-IC, they were completely unable to upregulate their um, glycolysis rate. And we also see this over here in this experiment where we're looking at um, DCs that were culture alone or in the presence of SEV. And this is baseline ECAR rate. So first off, the um, DCs with SEV had a lower baseline glycolysis rate. And then when we inhibit mitochondrial ATP synthesis with this chemical called FCCP um, that causes cells to shift entirely to glycolysis, they can't make ATP with mitochondria anymore. So this is a measure of maximal respiration rate. Um, the cells that were treated with SEV were completely unable to um, upregulate glycolysis to compensate for this. Um, so to summarize this part of the talk, extracellular vesicles are present at very high concentrations in semen and rapidly enter antigen-presenting cells. SEV impair the stimulation and activation of T cells primarily by impairing antigen-presenting cell function. Um, and I have some other lines of evidence that I didn't go over today that demonstrate that for CD8 T cells, this is likely by inhibiting cross-presentation of antigens. Um, and I'm actively looking at whether phenotypes in DCs other than IDO expression and metabolic function are altered by uh, exposure to SCV. And I'd also like to look at whether changes in DCs affect functions other than stimulating memory T cell immune responses. Um, okay, so what I've shown you so far is that SCV imp impede DC function, but what is it about SCV that might be mediating this effect? So as I mentioned, like every other extracellular vesicle, they carry a lot of proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. And perhaps the most studied cargo in EVs in general is RNA. And partly this is because RNA has a great potential for use as a biomarker in EVs because it's amplifiable and you can detect it at very low levels. So there's a, a, a lot of interest in using EVs in circulation as markers for, for cancers because cancers release um, extracellular vesicles into circulation. You can isolate extracellular vesicles and find differentially expressed RNAs to detect cancer. But whether or not these RNAs are actually functional in cells that take up EVs was a little unclear for a while. But I would say that in recent years, a number of papers, very convincing papers in many different fields have come out demonstrating that these RNAs actually are very functional. Um, so these are just some random examples that I pulled from literature in completely different systems, stem cell, cardiovascular biology, uh, glioblastomas, and even plants use um, RNAs and extracellular vesicles um, as functional messengers. So we decided to sequence the small RNA cargo in our semen extracellular vesicles. And this is a bioanalyzer trace of the total RNA we've isolated from SCV. And like other uh, vesicles, it's highly enriched for small RNAs. So we have some here around the 20 nucleotide region that are probably microRNAs. And then we had a large peak around 75 that we suspected was probably tRNA. So we sequenced um, these two different size fractions from 15 to 40 nucleotides and 40 to 100 nucleotides in six different semen donors. And this is a snapshot of the um, sequencing results at the most broad range, so what sort of RNAs are present. 
And as we expected, there are full-length tRNAs here in the 40 to 100 nucleotide library. There are also a lot of yRNAs, which is a regulatory RNA. Um, it's about 90 nucleotides, and it's important for DNA replication, but it's really not studied um, very much, and very little is known about yRNA. In our smaller libraries, we also found a lot of degradation products of these yRNAs. Um, as expected, we found mature microRNAs, too. And I'll just zoom in on these a little bit because the microRNAs are um, an interesting cargo because they're um, very regulatory in target cells. Um, when we look at the top 15 most abundant microRNAs that are present in our SEV, they account for over 90% of the reads. We believe that we can just look at these top 15 most abundant, and those are the ones that are actually present in enough volume to affect targets in a recipient cell. And we see that many of these microRNAs have validated immune-related microRNAs, or messenger RNAs that they do indeed target. So it could be that these microRNAs delivered by SCV are regulating targets in the cells, but I haven't yet followed up on proving that point. I'd like to just go over one other type of small RNA we found in our sequencing study because I thought it was really interesting. And that is that we found a lot of these tRNA fragments in our smaller libraries. It was even responsible for an even higher percentage of the sequencing reads than the mature microRNAs. Um, which I found very surprising. So I started to read more about tRNAs and discovered that transfer RNA-derived fragments is actually, um, it's a hot, generation of these tRNA fragments is a highly regulated process. So stress cells will activate enzymes that can specifically cleave um, specific tRNAs at specific locations, and it seems to be important for a stress response of a cell. Um, and when I looked at the sorts of distribution of tRNAs that we saw in our two different libraries, it seemed that um, there was an interesting pattern of loading into the vesicles. So if we expected that it was just random degradation products getting packaged into an EVE for, um, say, just cellular garbage or something, we would expect that the um, distribution of isoacceptor types would be the same between the full-length tRNAs and the fragmented tRNAs, and that wasn't the case at all. We saw um, a quite different distribution of the types of tRNAs that were fragmented or full-length that are carried by our vesicles. And when we map back the tRNAs to their um, full-length precursors, there was this interesting pattern where the tRNA fragments that were most prevalent, so the glycine and alanine isoacceptor types, were entirely the five prime ends of these tRNAs. 99% of the reads map to either um, a 19 nucleotide fraction for tRNA al alanine or um, a 28 nucleotide fraction with the tRNA glycine. Whereas tRNA um, fragments that were less prevalent in the EVs, some of them had these patterns that were more indicative of sort of random degradation products, implying that these are kind of specifically loaded into the EVs. And interestingly, a few papers have shown that these five prime tRNA halves of exactly the same lengths that I've seen um, inhibit protein translation in cells. So I've done one experiment to look at this. Um, and for this, I use THP cells, which is a monocytic cell line. It's very happy to take up SCV. And they were transfected with a Ranella luciferase expression plasmid and then treated with SCV. And we looked for the presence of the expression plasmid by qPCR, and all the cells got about the same amount of plasmid transfection. Um, but when we looked for the production of protein um, by reading out luciferase expression, we saw that the cells treated with a high dose of SCV were very impaired in producing Ranella luciferase, implying that protein production is indeed impaired in cells that take up a lot of EVs. Okay, so to summarize this part of the talk, SEV, like other extracellular vesicle types, are highly enriched for small, potentially regulatory RNAs, including mature microRNAs known to target immune-related mRNAs. Um, it's, we have not yet proven that these cargo RNAs are delivered to the cytosol of um, important cells in the f sufficient quantity to actually regulate cellular targets. Um, tRNA and yRNA fragments are commonly found in extracellular vesicles. So our study was one of the earlier ones, but many, many sequencing studies of EVs have subsequently come out and find very, found very similar things that tRNA fragments and yRNA fragments seem to be um, generated in a very controlled way and loaded into vesicles specifically. Um, and what the biological meaning of that is um, remains to be seen. And whether or not uh, they're packaged into EVs to functionally impair 
protein production in recipient cells or if it's just a cell getting rid of garbage, we don't yet know. So SCV impair memory immunity. This has important implications for vaccines against HIV and other STIs. But it's also interested in looking at how SEV might be directly impacting viral infections. So I started doing a little bit of work in HIV. Um, and for these experiments, I used the TZM indicator cell line. So this is the cell line that expresses um, HIV receptors. So it can be infected by HIV. And when it, infection with HIV happens, it turns on luciferase. So it's a very easy way to detect infection. And I've done experiments with SEV and HIV in these cell lines in a couple of different ways. Um, so one way that sort of mimics what would be biologically relevant is pre-incubating SEV and virus together before adding to the cells. I've also done these experiments where I incubate SEV and cells together before adding virus, either with washing off or not washing off um, the SEV before adding the virus. And these are the results from those inf uh, experiments. Um, so in a few different experiments, we saw that um, increasing the dose of SEV, we get increasing impairment of HIV infection in the TZM indicator cells. This was also true when um, EVs were added to the cells before adding virus, if they were left there. Um, if the extracellular vesicles were washed off before adding virus, the impaired infect is kind of only evident at the highest dose of SEV. So the greatest level of impairment occurs when the SEV and virus are incubated together before adding to the cells. So that's fine, but there is another group who is very actively working on HIV and SEV um, infection, and they've made a lot more progress in terms of um, discerning the mechanism of this and things. And if you're interested, I would point you to their uh, publications. Um, and I became more interested in studying how SCV might be impacting Zika virus um, at the start of the Zika epidemic a few years ago. Um, so I had a, a project looking at s modeling sexual transmission of Zika virus in the female genital mucosa. And when I started, uh, although there was really uh, clear and convincing evidence that Zika can be transmitted sexually, um, what cell types were uh, initially infected and replicating virus in the female mucosa was not yet known. Um, so just to convince you that Zika does infect um, uh, human epithelial, vaginal epithelial cells, uh, I'll tell you about our model system. So we use um, primary human epithelial cells in ex vivo vaginal tissues. So we get surgical scraps um, from vaginal repair surgeries and from hysterectomies so we can get cervical tissues as well. And we can use these tissues either as like biopsy sized pieces to do experiments or we can digest them and do some cell culture tricks to turn them into primary and transformed epithelial cell limes from vaginal epithelium, endo, cervical, or ectocervical. And all of these three tissue types have distinctly different epithelial cell um, phenotypes. So it's important to look at all three. So my first experiments were just looking at whether these cells are infectable by Zika virus. Um, here I'm gonna present data just looking at RNA viral load in these cell types. And we saw indeed that Zika does replicate in genital epithelial cells. It takes about two days for replication to really occur, but it occurs in all three of the cell types we've looked at and to varying levels in different donors. I looked at infection in a number of other ways as well, like immunofluorescent staining for viral proteins and production of viral, uh, production of progeny variants and supernanes. And those all correlate really well with um, RNA levels in the cells. So I'm only presenting RNA today. So again, we did the same sorts of experiments as HIV with uh, SCV and Zika. So pre-incubating variants with SCV and then adding to cells and looking for um, product, productive infection by RNA viral load. And here's an example from one experiment. So we're reading viral load by digital droplet PCR um, in the cells. And what you saw here is Zika alone, we got good infection level in the cells. When uh, this variants were pre-incubated with SCV, we got strong impairment. Um, and when they were pre-incubated with a, a hundredfold less SCV, there was no impairment. Um, and this is a summary of all the experiments we've done thus far with SCV and Zika infection. So the E6 is 10 to the sixth um, SCV per PFU of Zika. And in every um, cell line we've studied thus far, we get over 50% inhibition of infection. So strongly impaired infection uh, in the presence of this many SCV. 
as we decrease the level, the ratio of SEV to virgin, we see decreasing levels of impairment. And we plan to continue studying lower and lower doses. Um, and this is really interesting in the context of the, this paper that came out earlier this year that was a systematic survey of Zika virus detection in the semen of um, symptomatic infected men. Um, so they collected a lot of symptomatic men and looked at uh, semen shedding over months and months, and they found that finding Zika virus RNA was extremely common in these men, and it persisted for a long time and sometimes more than six months. And the novelty of the study is that they actually took a lot of these semen samples and tried to culture out infectious virus. And interestingly, in only three of 78 samples with detectable Zika virus RNA were they able to get uh, transmission of infection. And these three uh, were all um, samples that had more than seven log copies of RNA per ml of semen. So suggesting that you need an extremely high viral load in semen in order to get sexual transmission. And potentially this is because SCV are so impairing to infection. So to summarize this part of the talk, SCV impairs HIV and Zika virus infection. Um, Pre-incubating variants in SCV is the most effective way to inhibit infection, and this is the best mimic of what would be a true biological situation. And it suggests the effect isn't entirely on the cell, that there's some level of occupying receptors or hiding a virus from being able to bind its receptors on a cell. Um, some preliminary evidence suggests that there's this dose, dose threshold of SEV per virion, below which, as in the case of samples with very high viral loads, the virus can overcome this SEV mediated inhibition and actually sexually transmit. Um, what we don't know is the mechanism of this effect. Um, are the SEV preventing binding an initial infection? Are they redirecting trafficking of virus? Are they somehow altering production of progeny virions? And this is, um, these are questions that we're very actively researching right now. Um, other questions I'd like to address as we continue is whether SEV changes the immune responses to virus and whether other components of semen, like the SEV-depleted seminal supernatant, have similar or different sorts of effects on viral infection. Okay, so for the last part of my talk, I would just like to um, introduce an idea that I'm thinking about and haven't done a lot of active research in yet, but I think it's really interesting. And that's the idea that um, variation in immunosuppression mediated by semen might help to explain some fertility and pregnancy complications. And this arises from sort of looking at all the um, experiments we did that I presented first that were looking at impairment of um, T cell responses in the presence of SEV. So here we're plotting just in general the percent reduction from the no SEV exposure conditions for all the different antigens we've tested and for all the different assays, so cytokine production, CD107A expression, or direct killing by cytotoxic T cells. And what we saw is this um, interesting effect where donor is a PBMC donor or um, SEV recipient. And we observed that there were certain recipients who had less um, impairment in every assay we tested over here, and certain recipients who were highly impaired in every assay we tested. And then there were some who it seemed sort of assay dependent, like this person's killing was highly impaired, but maybe cytokine production was much less impaired. Um, and that's really interesting um, to think about, because when you think about it, exposure to semen and to alloantigenetic fetuses really represents a remarkable immune tolerance. In any other context, exposure to cells um, from another person would be uh, highly immune inducing, but it's not for semen. Allergies to semen are extremely rare. Um, so something about semen and the female genetic mucosa is just exquisitely fine-tuned for tolerance, specifically to paternal antigens. Um, However, it appears that there is some recipient level variability and susceptibility to SEV mediated immunosuppression. And thinking about this, it's really interesting because roughly a third of cases of infertility are currently unexplained by a diagnosable medical cause. Um, the risk of pregnancy complications increase in pregnancies resulting from assisted reproductive technologies where semen isn't present or with less exposure to a specific partner semen. And mouse studies have implicated soluble factors, which include SCV um, in semen, as uh, essential to generating alloantigen-specific Tregs, but the mechanism of this is not well understood. 
Um, so we really think that by studying the mechanism of how semen induces specific tolerance in recipient cells, it could really inform maternal fetal medicine and maybe um, reveal some new strategies to address these issues. It has important implications for infectious disease, of course, but it also might just generally reveal new strategies and pathways that we could target to therapeutically manipulate um, cells like APCs um, to turn them tolerogenic and treat um, diseases like autoimmune diseases. Okay, so with that, I will give my overall summary. Uh, my work focuses on how semen impacts immunity and viral pathogenesis. And again, this has important implications for vaccines against STIs. We need to think about overcoming and impaired antigen presenting cell function when semen is present. So we need to think about therapies, strategies, vaccines that will overcome this immunosuppressive effect. Uh, SE, semen has direct effects on viral infection, and it's important to remember that a simple analysis of an RNA viral load in semen, a very bioactive fluid, will, will not tell the whole story of the infectious potential in the context of sexual transmission of that virus. Um, and this has important implications for fertility and pregnancy. Um, does variation in semen-mediated semen immunosuppression, in particular partner pairs, contribute to unexplained infertility, recurrent miscarriage, preeclampsia, preterm birth, et cetera? And this is a research direction I hope to pursue in the future. And with that, I will make my acknowledgments, and I'd like to um, especially acknowledge my mentor, Florian Haddock, who originated a lot of these projects and has been a wonderful mentor and colleague, and we hope to continue to work closely together in the future. Um, all the people in his group who have, uh, current and past, who have helped with these projects. And if you wanna see what they're up to, they have a pretty neat website, hlab.science. Um, any questions or comments, and if anyone is, um, working in EVs or interested in working in EVs. I used to run a little EV interest group that we would love to get going again. Um, we just talk about techniques and how to work with these vesicles because um, some of the experimental approaches are a little bit difficult and it's really nice to talk about with others working in this field. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the people in my department and other collaborators who have helped with this. And these are the surgeons who provide us with um, tissues from vaginal surgeries and hysterectomies, which is very, very important to our work. We couldn't do it without them, and of course, my funding sources, and I would be happy to take any questions. Where do you think the extracellular vesicles are coming from within the male anatomy, and does it, do you think that vesicles coming from different parts of the male anatomy could lend different immunomodulatory immuno Definitely, I think that's definitely true. So they're, largely coming from the prostate gland. And in literature, in the papers from the 70s and 80s, people who originally described vesicles in semen, they called them prostosomes because they thought they were arising entirely from the prostate gland. But you can look at RNA markers and things and find them from all tissues in the male genital tract, including like MHC2, implying that there are some leukocyte-derived vesicles in there as well. Um, and I think it's entirely possible that they have different functions. I mean, one way we could study that is isolating vesicles from isolated tissues or cell types and seeing if they do the same thing. Are you able to sort? It's really, it, it, no, basically. Flow is really, these are s smaller than light, so it's not trivial to do flow cytometry. It takes a dedicated machine and a lot of expertise and flow technology is not there. You can do some sort of immunoselection sorting if you have a specific marker like a protein marker, you can use antibodies, but that's about the level of sorting right now. So um, so my question is about in the presence of infection, mm -hmm. do you think that the, 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 t the number or the um, cargo within the vesicles is changed and that that... That's a great question. So we haven't looked at that. We've been only looking at healthy men. Um, we do have a project looking at opioid users and semen. We're going to look at extracellular RNA profiles in vesicle and non-vesicular fractions in opioid users, and I think that'll be really interesting to see if there are big differences there. But we don't know. We haven't looked. I would suspect in infection you probably would find a lot more leukocyte-derived vesicles. Thank you for your talk. It was super interesting. Um, there's been a lot of work recently in resident memory cells. Mm -hmm. And what this talk makes me think about is that, you know, in a young woman versus a sexually active woman, there's a window in which to vaccinate 
but mm -hmm. might the presence of semen later in life undo any good that could have been done with a, a, a tissue-specific vaccine, right? So if yeah. HPV or herpes or whatever, you could, you could vaccinate a young woman. Do you have any way to figure out whether if we make a good vaccine and give it to yeah. teenagers or whatnot, that it will persist into adulthood? Uh, no, but I would say, I mean, the HPV vaccine, which is mostly antibody-based, does work. So uh, there must be ways to induce, in, induce immunity that does protect against viral infections. I just think we need to think about it. And, you know, I think if you had a really strong, robust um, tissue resonant um, immune response, you probably would be overcoming the effect of semen because it's probably relatively transient. Right, like these things are probably cleared within 24 hours or something of sexual exposure, and a virus would be there much longer. So, yeah. uh, do you think that this effect could be used to counsel patients either with infections or with infertility as to uh, kind of stack the odds in their favor for? clearing infection or for increased fertility? Um, yeah, I think so. I don't know if our knowledge is at the point to make clinical recommendations like that, but I think for like HPV, it is clear that it's like, if you have H active HPV infections, using condoms really helps. That's partially probably due to just less exposure to virus if you're treating virus back and forth, but also increasing good immune responses. In terms of infertility, that's just all hypothesis right now. So actually a lot of, um, some types of assisted reproductive technologies actually include, will add back components from semen because they have seen that it does have a, a positive effect. And um, so that is being done. <laughs> 